Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. That's right. When you don't know what to do, just keep on breathing from the City of Angels in Los Angeles. Welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver at caregiverdave.com, along with my lovely co-host, former mayor of a California beach town and best-selling author of, are you ready? The Happiest Corruption, Sleaze, Lies, and Suicide in California in a California beach town, Debbie Peterson, who actually is also my guest interview today. <laughs> And we are also coming to you live and on demand 24-7 on numerous syndicated radio and podcast networks on 26 global audio and video platforms, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, Stitcher Radio, Blog Talk Radio, and the list goes on. We can, um, we're very proud to be voted number one caregiver podcast of the top 50 on Player FM. Number two caregiver podcast on Feedspot out of the top 16. Number two on caringvillage.com. And we have an exciting and exciting show planned for you today. As I said, Debbie Peterson will be talking about her passion and her passion. Well, I'll just let you share that. <laughs> Before I do, I want to take this moment to thank, to thank my last week's guest, Fatima Bustos Choi. And she was over 30 years corporate business management, organizational and leadership development consulting experience, has helped and facilitated leadership development programs for major corporations such as Citibank, IBM, Wells Fargo, etc. And just a reminder, if you want to watch or listen to that interview and all our interviews, including this one, go to our membership website, caregiverdave.com or any of the other 26 global networks that I mentioned earlier. All right, enough of that. Debbie, welcome to the Caregiver Dave show again. <laughs> oh, hi, Dave. Welcome. Welcome to you, too. I guess as a co-host, I'm. we're doing double duty today. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I've, as you know, I like to ask my guest just who is Debbie Peterson these days and why was she placed on this earth? Oh, I love that question. Um, I am a former mayor. And I help to equip people to know how to become effectively involved in local government so that they can give the people they elect to represent them their marching orders. So I'm hoping that uh, today we can do a little bit of work on that and help folks know how they can let other people know what their needs are and how they could be met by those we're electing and paying taxes to. <laughs> or not to, we pay those to the government. They just manage it. <laughs> Yes, things have certainly gotten out of hand with America. It used to be of the people, by the people, for the people, and now it's uh, of the politician, by the politician, for the politician, and bureaucrat. And all these people that we didn't even elect that have so much power over us, don't get me started. But, you know, it's easy for caregivers to not be concerned about government or politics or who's running for city council or school board. But, you know, that's where it all starts. That's where the corruption starts in the lower level uh, elections. And that's where, you know, if we don't stop it, it goes straight up to the White House. So I believe I've, I met some um, people in Hawaii because I would speak a lot in Hawaii. They actually have a respite care bill that got passed. And it was just an experiment, but it, it went very well. And now they're, they're adding to it. It started out at $1,500 a month. Every caregiver who signed up for it could get no strings, no questions asked, no limit to how much money you could make. Because caregivers, whether they make $50,000 or $100,000 or $150,000, just need help. You know, If they've got a business, they need help uh, hiring someone to help with them so that they don't uh, suffer in their business or they don't get fired from their job, et cetera. And I think that might be up to 2,500 a month, but don't quote me on that. I, I just think that's what it went up to. And if Hawaii could do it, well, darn it. Why can't California do it? Why can't 
New York do it? Why can't New Jersey and Oregon and, and all the other states of the union? But you know what? They're not going to do it unless people like us, caregivers, I know you're a former caregiver, just scream. All it takes is a, a phone call to your politician, right? Um, uh, I don't want to steal any of your thunder, but uh, they say that one phone call is worth like a thousand and one letter is worth uh would that be more than a thousand or less than a thousand i think less <laughs> than a thousand maybe 500 a letter is not as important no i think a letter it takes more trouble to do than a phone call right phone call is easy anyway yeah well uh, and we are absolutely on the same page with with everything you've just said dave and um, I think you said, you know, the bad stuff starts at the local level. And it's true. When we uh, when we elect people, <laughs> when we elect people whose goal is to serve themselves, and as caregivers, we certainly know about selfless serving. But if we elect people who are serving themselves, and they will keep going up the line. But if we elect people who are serving those who elected them, who are, who are representing their communities, they also move up the line and we end up with better people at the top. So I'm with you all the way on that. And, um, you know, it's not as simple as just a letter. And it occurs to me when you're saying that it is also another thing that folks can do is get in front of their policymakers, get in their faces. And, and that doesn't mean you have to stand on a sign with a picket or, um, but let me give you an example I, I have from another podcast that was just it, I was so so tickled by it. Um, it was a it was a gentleman who himself is in a wheelchair and runs his own podcast. And what he did is what they had in their neighborhood or in their community was a whole lot of sidewalks with no curb cuts. And a curb cut is that area, that little right. ramp that goes from the sidewalk to the street that allows you, if you're in a wheelchair or if you're pushing a stroller, if you've got a child, a small child or or an adult in a similar um, contraption, um, it allows you to get off the sidewalk across the street and back onto the next sidewalk. And his community did not have those. And a lot of communities don't because they're very expensive and the legislation about what they're supposed to be like is always changing and you can't just keep going in and redoing public works. However, I'm going off track here. What, what he did is he got every council member to agree to be pushed in a wheelchair along a sidewalk and to have the experience of what it was like trying to get off a sidewalk onto the street without a ramp. And after that, the city implemented um, curb cuts on all their sidewalks. And basically what they did is they got in front of them, they got in their faces. And now you can do that by going to council meetings. And certainly if a lot of people show up with the people they care for, or if that's not an option, just a lot of people show up with a few um, people that they care for, that has impact. But the other thing that occurred to me while you were talking is when I was a mayor and we would travel up to Sacramento to speak with our um, with our state representatives, our senators and representatives, um, they were a we were able to get a lot more done simply by sitting down with them, even if it was a 15 minute interview, because we could then take to them what our constituents wanted. So you can talk to your mayor because your mayor is going to be talking higher up the line. But you could also perhaps get that 15 minute slot with your state representative or even your national representative. And uh -huh. you want to get in front of the people who have the power to change what it is you need changed. Um, but there is something about meeting with someone face to face. I would say I remember probably almost every face to face I had meet meeting I had with a constituent because they're that, rare aren't they they're rare <laughs> they are rare and the reality is if if you've got representatives who care about representing their community they want to meet with you if they don't want to meet with you elect someone different <laughs> <laughs> and what's since you were a mayor and you've seen a lot of the local elections what are some tips that you can give to voters uh, caregiver voters uh, because, uh, you know, there are so many of them. We are saving the medical industry billions with a B and billions and billions and billions of dollars. And yet they're just quiet and silent and they do their job. And, you know, I came from the uh, Abilities Expo 
uh, at the uh, trade fair at the convention center in Los Angeles. And uh, my heart was just broken. All of these uh, special needs kids and the parents were just silently trudging along, taking care of them, you know, overwhelmed. Those are the lucky ones. The unlucky ones are the ones where their spouse left and, and they got to do all this by themselves as a single parent. But um, what tips can you give um, caregivers who want to be politically involved and want to help caregivers in general and th themselves in particular, how can they tell uh, a phony politician who's just there to serve himself and climb up the ladder versus a politician who really cares about uh, him or her? Well, I think, uh, you know, you really can tell who people are by how they act. So if they don't have time for you, if they don't want to hear your questions, if they won't meet with you, if they won't give you your two minutes in a public meeting, if they won't even facilitate that two minutes by perhaps bringing you the mic because you're in a wheelchair and it's hard to get up to uh, a lectern that's yeah. made for people who are standing up, not sitting down. Yeah, there's a red flag right there. Huh? Mm -hmm. If they won't facilitate um, you having a voice, Find someone who will elect someone who will. Now, how do you tell? And again, it's it's actions. Even when they're running for office, who do they choose to? Um, who do they choose to listen to? Who do they choose to talk to? And on the other side of that is understanding um, as a citizen that you and the person you care for that they don't know what you need unless you tell them, because they're not sitting in your wheelchair, or they're not sitting at your bedside, they're not in your home, they're not on your street. If you don't tell them, they can't represent you. And one way you can do that is by sending them information about things that do work. So you can do some of that research for them. If we're talking local government, your representatives do their own research. There's nobody handing it to them on a plate. If you can send them information about how it was done in Hawaii, even some links, email them or text them, that will make a big difference. That will shortcut their work and make it easier for them to support what you need. The other thing is it's all it's a numbers game. And that is the reality of a democracy. The majority wins. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. And so <laughs> if there's something that's really important to others in your community that they that's within their jurisdiction, and that's another thing to do, make sure that it's within their jurisdiction or just even ask them if it is or isn't and ask them to send you where it would be, um, then um, you can do it in numbers. And numbers are very powerful, especially if you if those numbers are people who need um, some extra help and they show up. That's a really potent visual. Yeah. You know, I came from a small town in Burbank, California, beautiful downtown Burbank. Oh, yeah. I and, still say that. Yeah. Well, I'm and, from beautiful downtown Grover Beach, which is even smaller. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rowan and Martin's laughing made it very oh, famous. I love it. And, um, yeah. But we had a mayor um campaign went to, actually she campaigned for the city council and then they rotated mayors you know it's kind of like the mm -hmm. la county board of supervisors no one is elected mayor but um she uh would go from house to house when she first started campaigning nobody knew who she was she was just a, a mom a single mom at that and she knocked on every single door and she said, introduced herself and shook her hand uh, with the person who answered the door and just told her, you know, what she wanted to do. And it must have taken her months and months and months to visit as many homes as she did. But she got elected and she eventually became mayor. And she was probably the best mayor uh, that Burbank ever had. Um, do people do that anymore? <laughs> Since they I have staffed, knocked on, you know? yes, I have knocked on every voter's door in my community <clears throat> um, five times really? because I've had five elections. Yeah. And one of the most memorable, in fact, two of the most memorable, memorable I've had, again, is when people you get in their faces or they get mm -hmm. in your face in a, in a constructive way, but they're memorable. Um, one was with, a, a gentleman, a retired police officer who was in his garage, answered his door and um, in a wheelchair, talked to me about having MS and about the only way, the only way he lived a normal life, uh, you know, a, a, had, a, had a life. The only way he had a life was um, by the cannabis deliveries that were brought to him. And it hadn't oh. been legalized at that point. 
And so I uh, that really helped me when I was campaigning and it helped me when I was elected because I really understood then how important um, having safe cannabis, regulated cannabis for people who needed it medically, how important that was. And on another occasion, I, I um, a caregiver giver came to the door and she had this delightful 93 year old client who was as sharp as a tack, who um, really wanted to meet a, a younger woman who was running for office. And we had the most wonderful talk about the history of the community. And so um, I, I can tell you that, yes, that's that's how you recognize someone who, who gives a damn is <laughs> they're going to knock on your door and then they're going to listen. And then they're going to take what you tell them and 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 apply it when it comes to voting. Yeah, well, I don't remember anyone doing that since her. And uh, everyone just spends money on TV. And I'm sick of those ads every yeah, time the election too. comes around because they're they're not even telling you what they're going to do. They're going to tell telling you why the other guy is a jerk. You know, mm -hmm. and um, that's no way to win votes and influence people, is it? No, I, I didn't do that. I refuse to do it. And I lose respect for people who do. And um, there are some times where you do need to speak the truth. And if the other guy's corrupt, um, you you should say so, in my opinion. People have the right to know. Um, but smear campaigns, whispering campaigns, those kinds of devious communications to win votes, they are unfortunately effective. Um, but I, I don't vote for those people. Mm. Uh, I've I'm always looking for someone with integrity. And frankly, I don't care at all what party they are. I care whether they have integrity because the way our system is set up, we are we are to be um, legislating for the people we represent. And we can work together if we are all seeking the common good. Mm -hmm. But if we're seeking our own best interest, we can't, there's no win-win when someone else is seeking their best interest because they want the win. So, um, it all it does boil down again to choosing who you elect um, and and whether they'll be looking out for your interests or their own. Um, yeah. One way too that people can tell is, and this is something that's quite interesting. Psychologists, I write a column for Psychology Today, and so yeah. I look at a lot at these things. I look at women in government. By they asked me to look at it's called where women govern. I look at women in governance. I look at corruption. I look at happiness. Um, and a look at government. And one of the um, things they found is, psychologists have found, is that people can actually judge just from a picture whether someone's going to break the fair election rules, the fair political campaign rules. Uh, and it's the oddest thing, 70% 70, 70 of the time, just by looking at a, at a picture, people can tell if someone is corrupt or not. And so one of my pieces of advice to people is trust your gut, trust your instinct, trust your insight. You can test it, don't make accusations. But if it doesn't look right, if someone's not seeming to pass that smell test, if in your gut you just don't feel good, uh, check it out. Take take the next step and find out if your gut's right. Usually it is. You know, um, I was a child of the 70s, a uh, teenager. And, you know... Um, Me too. Uh, it was a generation <laughs> where, you know, we were just rebelling against everything. And, and you know, we, we were rebelling against the war. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we were re rebelling against Nixon. And, and I remember going in head shops and I would see a big poster of... Yeah what they call tricky dicky and it says <laughs> yes. at the bottom would you buy a used car from this man <laughs> you know no. so i know um benjamin franklin one of our founding fathers said a couple of things the first thing he said was um evil men rule when good men do nothing and i know yeah. it's a thankless job who would want to get involved in a in a city council who would want to get involved in even a school board meeting uh you know the meetings are so boring, and and they spend hours talking about you know the color of of uh, chalk that they should use on the board. I mean, oh my <laughs> gosh, give me a break! But uh, if if good people don't step up, you know, because uh, politics was never supposed to be a career decision. You know, you go and you volunteer, and then you go home and you let the next guy do it. And somehow we've gotten away from that. But uh, it's true that evil men rule when good men do nothing. And if good men don't step up. 
uh, opportunists and people who are greedy and and uh, want to profit from politics will step up and and do the job, and we see that they absolutely will. And he also said that power corrupts, and ultimate power corrupts ultimately. The media is supposed to be the watchdog of of government, but unfortunately, they seem to be in bed with government, and they do each other favors. And as you know, in a place like California, where two thirds of our state is controlled by one party, and they just have a, a lock grip on the power. And I don't care what um, what uh, party is in power; uh, they're prone to uh, to corruption, whether it's uh, Republicans or Democrats. We have it's supposed to be the balance of power, right? And um, if the media won't do their job, then we're supposed to be the watchmen. Uh, we're supposed to be. Now, you have an interesting story of how you uh, broke down, found, and exposed, uh, and brought down corruption in your community. And I know it's in the book, so so uh, it's already public information. So, uh, what can you share with us to entice us to maybe read your book? Well, there's a lot that I haven't shared that maybe I will be able to share at some time in the future because um, it's not public yet. Right. Uh, no, but, all the bodies uh, are buried. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's all about the murders, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and, and I want to, before I do that, I have, we got a couple of minutes left. Do I have time to say, okay. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about that power corrupts because when we say that to ourselves, then we say, well, there's no hope is there. If power corrupts, then what's the point? So I went back and looked at, again, in my role as a, a blogger for Psychology Today, does power corrupt? And what, what they found is what we were talking about earlier, and that is that power does corrupt people, but it doesn't corrupt everybody. Mm -hmm. So how do you know the incorruptibles? And we won't go into all of that here, but there are incorruptible people. And um, they're usually people of, of strong values that are highly invested in their values. And so, and what but does the that other mean, thing highly mind, invested in their values. Ah, uh, yeah, there's that's a psychological type. It's people who whose values are very important to them, who take them very seriously, who have, um, you know, take strong moral stances on things and stand by them despite opposition or despite. You're talking about good uh, people here. Are you talking about good both people. good and bad? I'm talking about good people. Okay. So there are people who can't be corrupted. I suppose you there are make people that who, who are very uh, committed to their evil values, right? I'm assuming. Yes, <laughs> and and that's the second part of of, of my response here, and that is that um, e e some people see power as a means to serving themselves, as a means to self advancement. Other people see power as an opportunity to serve. If you're electing people who see power as an opportunity to serve, the likelihood of them being corrupted is much is much smaller. Mm. So it starts even at the local level, as we said earlier, by um, identifying people who see power as an opportunity to do good, and we'll use it that way. Mm. And so um, it's not that power corrupts, it's that we elect people, or people arise, as you mentioned earlier, people come along who are gonna take advantage of, of an opportunity to use power to their own ends. But there are those who do not do that. And of course, have, those are the ones that we need to elect. Have you seen good people with good motives who were drawn into the the corruption of uh, politics and, you know, money won them over? Uh, they, the Bible says uh, money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money. And let's face it, uh, money is is big with politics, and that's where a lot of the corruption comes from. The money, yes, it power. does, and it's almost it's a it's a systemic, institutionalized corruption that we have built in, and so you can't, you almost can't. Some people say you can't blame people for for working within the system, mm -hmm. um, but yes, politicians have to spend thirty to seventy percent of their time at a higher level, not at the local level, but at the higher level, thirty to seventy percent of their time is spent simply asking for money. So, if we were to take the money out of elections, we would have um, we'd eliminate a lot of that corrupt motive. There are a lot of things that we can do. Um, um, and I don't want to go into all of that, but um, I agree with you on that. And um, I wanted to talk about, oh, yes, you mentioned, um, I'm, I'm not answering your question yet. Okay. <laughs> so you'll have to remind me what it was because I've forgotten it now. <laughs> but the <laughs> the other thing was that um, you mentioned 
needing to rely on the press and media as the fourth estate. And um, I, I'm going to say that that the in fourth fact, branch really, of government, the fourth branch of government, the most important branch of government is you and me mm -hmm. and the people we're talking to and everybody else, we the people, because it is our government. It's nobody else's responsibility to make sure that government does the job right, but ours. It's our job. It belongs to us. Mm -hmm. And and that's the kind of government that was set up that we are a part of. And another little example of one of the things that I observed, and it's a reason why it is important for caregivers and those they care for to be represented. When I, I ended up in a wheelchair for a period of time. I had a, a broken ankle um, mm -hmm. and um, I had another situation at one point where I was in a wheelchair for a while. And I was a city council member at the time, and I would find that I would manage to get out of my car, manage to get my wheelchair out, and then I couldn't get up on the sidewalk because there are these curb barriers you can't get. So it it was almost impossible for me to get into a meeting. And I realized that the people building these wheelchair accessible places um, have no clue about what accessible really means. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it is really important for us. Uh, and, and I know even in my own, I have a mixed use building where I have my office and my home and I have to provide parking spaces and I have to provide a wheelchair accessible. Well, guess where the city said I had to put the wheelchair accessible? The, the farthest, most far possible spot from the accessible entrance. The farthest parking spot, not right alongside it, but as far away as you could get. And I'm thinking, who in their right mind is thinking that that is in any way accessible for someone who has difficulty walking, difficulty breathing, is in a wheelchair? That's outrageous. And so, and I noticed that when I was on the planning commission. So it's really important for us who live that experience day to day to share that experience and to make sure that, that, um, even at a practical level, things are being designed that that work. Because why waste all that money with wheelchair accessible parking spaces where you have to park in one that's not wheelchair accessible to get access? That's right. And <laughs> another one that I saw on social media on Facebook, which uh, I can't even believe it's real because it's so outrageously funny and ridiculous funny, is that um, the, the guy took a video. It, it's it's a building downtown. And it's got this little pedestal with a button that says, uh, handicapped people, press the button and the doors will open. So he pressed the button and he's videoing this and the doors open up. And guess what's on the other side of the doors? A long More doors? flight of stairs. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> uh, uh, Who just... in the world was thinking when they did that? You know what? You have inspired me. This has inspired <laughs> me. I am going to take a picture of that parking space at my building and i'm going to make a big deal out of it i'm going to yeah. i'm going to put that up on take Facebook. your own advice <laughs> take my own advice and you know why didn't i do that 10 years ago i don't <laughs> five years ago when i bought it geez so um these are good conversations i don't remember your last question my question all. was how yeah. did you uh with all the public information that's in your book how did you bring down the corruption i mean oh it was a numbers game again, and that's the whole thing. You know, we we vote. It's the majority wins. It's how many people. And and what happened is I didn't go into it aware of corruption at all. I, in fact, my first four years on the like planning Like Mr. Smith goes to Washington, right? Yeah. Yeah. My first four years on the planning commission were delightful. Uh, they were every they did everything the way it should have been done, apart from wheelchair access. <laughs> and, uh, um, but it was a, a really a nice experience. It, it was perfect. And um, then I got on the city council and a former mayor came to me and said, Debbie, I, I think you need to know. And it's funny because of where it was. He says, you got to clean up the sewer district. <laughs> There's corruption at the sewer district. And um, and then more and more people came out. We had whistleblowers. We had I had people asking to meet with me about other um areas that were corrupt i did see things as well i was sitting on committees so you came in with the white hat on and people says oh maybe maybe she can help us i think that may be what happened because i had an open door i was willing to listen i and i would i would act and i would speak out and and so um 
I found you were brave because you were young and naive. And, you know, how they say <laughs> fools rush in where angels dare to tread. <laughs> well, I wasn't young. You know, I think I was 50, 55 when I started. Well, young, maybe late young to the council. Uh, you know, oh, young to the new. new blood. I was, new. New, I was blood. new. And I think being female as well, because we don't know the old boys mm. club. We've never been in it. We don't know how it operates. We just do what we think's what we think we're supposed to do. Uh, and um, some women end up becoming more corrupted, but usually not as corrupted as the men. Mm. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and that really is one of the things that I would suggest that I, as I started looking at who it was, who was fixing it, it was about 50, 50 men and women working together in tandem. Um, however, when it came to the government level, it was the women on the government boards, the women CEOs who'd been CEOs who recognized that things weren't things weren't right on these boards, and something had to change. If they weren't corrupt, they would soon be. And and it was the women CEOs who got together and convinced the men that it had to be done better. Mm. And uh, and so that convinced me that like your wonderful female mayor in in beautiful downtown Burbank, yeah. um, that. I started to research that and I thought, well, is this true everywhere in the world? Is it just like in my town that the women are doing this or is this everywhere? And it turns out it's everywhere. It These these kinds of things happen all over the world when women get Same into Same devil office. all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. Same, yeah. Same yeah. MO. Yeah, people, the psychology of people really doesn't change country <laughs> to country. <laughs> we're, we're all human beings for better and for worse. Um, yeah. So... Um, so we took it down. It, it takes a lot of people and it takes all different kinds of people. Some people just go show up at meetings so that people know that, so that your elected representatives know you're paying attention. Yeah. That's all you have to do. Show up. Some people yeah. can speak. Some people can research. Some people have connections. Some people are good at social media. Um, but it takes, it takes a village to fix yeah. it. You know, I have a gas station in a tiny little community in Castaic, Northern LA County. Oh, and yeah. It's unincorporated. And we have like way too many gas stations there. I'm just one of like five. And these millionaires uh, who run multiple stations, they're always looking for places to put more gas stations, right? It's like Hamburger Hill down down in uh, Lions <laughs> yeah. Avenue. It's got how many hamburger places do you need? Yeah, you know, where's the planning? Where does it say, okay, that's enough gas station? Uh, we could use another restaurant or something. Anyway, um, three different times. Um, uh, gas stations tried to come in and I was on the planning board as well. Uh, it was a town council. So I was on the, uh, the planning board of the town council. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it has to be okayed by the, by the County, but they, they always send them to us first. And I know I was a little prejudiced, but, um, I, I did a letter writing campaign and said to people, do you think that five gas stations in this little tiny community and three truck stops <laughs> are uh, enough? You know, there's traffic congestion already. People don't even want to go down that road where these big tractor trailers are coming in and out. There's smog, the pollution. And I just managed to rile up the community and uh, convince them to show up at the meetings you know, I got a hundred people to show up at a meeting and that's like Good huge. For you. It takes a hundred people. I would, I'm, that's my number. And you have their attention. People. Even if you get 50 people there or 20 mm -hmm. people, you've got, because the average attendance at a meeting is pathetic, you know? Yeah. To sit for those boring meetings. But if you have an issue, you know, start a letter writing campaign and get people to show up at the meeting. And I'll tell you that, that one after the other, that one thing just went down. And then uh, a few year, a few years later, somebody else tried it. I, we did it again. It went down. And the third time, same thing. Got people to show up at the meetings. It went down. So y you have a voice. And um, mm -hmm. now I'm a good guy. If if I was not a good guy, see, the bad guys can do the same thing. If they have some project that is only going to profit them and it's going to be bad for the community, and they can get people to show up at the meetings and they can make it look like, yeah, everyone's for this because the other people, they're apathetic. So that's yes. two cents on that. And that's the importance of paying attention and going to the mm -hmm. meetings, even when they're boring, because they will slip things by you, <laughs> especially when they're corrupt. They will slip things by you. And there are a lot of sneaky tricks um, that that administrators and and 
elected officials will use to not have to let you know what's really going on and to be sure they don't get 100 people at the meeting because they don't necessarily want 100 people at the meeting. <laughs> right, right, right. That's yeah, too much work yeah. for them. So, so you have to pay attention. Now that you've been a politician, uh, would you ever consider doing it again if you had a motive and a reason? I don't think I will do will ever do it again. No, I for one thing, I served for fifteen years, and oh, wow. I do I do really That's believe. I mean, by the time I was on the planning commission and and then the council and then mayor and then back to the commission. Yeah. And I think that's dues. long enough for anybody. Um, it's a little bit like caregiving, you know, you don't make money on the council. And, and if it, I had to self-employed, I've got to find a way to have some money to retire on. So, and it, it does eat into your time. It makes it more difficult to, to, to make the money that you need to make yeah. for yourself. So um, 15 years was enough. And um my service, my community service now is to write about what I found and to help other people know how to um, take up their role as we the people. Yeah. Now, did you write two books? I, I see, have. I actually I have. City, City Council 101. Yeah. And those, The Happiest mm -hmm. Corruption. Yeah. Those are the two in the series. And then I have another fun one. This oh, one yeah. is... I don't know if you've met Angel Hartwell in any of your no. podcast journeys, but she does a um, a podcast called Wickedly Smart Women. <laughs> <laughs> she did an anthology and she asked me to do a chapter. And so my chapter is the dirty little secret of San Luis Obispo County. So that that's where I figured out actually that it was women in government who were making the difference. And um and so that I'm really glad I did that with Angel. But so I have those. But the the original book is The Happiest Corruption, Sleaze, Lies, and Suicide in a California. Why do you call it The Happiest Corruption? Because Oprah uh, said that our county seat was the happiest town in America, San Luis Obispo, in 2011. And we are really happy here. And it is a fabulous, beautiful county How and did she no, know that did she live there in san luis Obispo? she lived in montecito but you know actually I think it was she was interviewing an author who was choosing the happiest towns in the world sort of thing and california always ranks really high as happy because it's hard not to be happy when the weather's always good and you've got the beach and the mountains and yeah. so um anyway but we were Warwick even there. sang a song about san uh oh no yeah. that was san jose but uh yeah and it's you close. know uh, left lost left my heart in san francisco was that sinatra okay. and uh or Tony Bennett. Como or somebody Tony Bennett. back then <clears throat> but um so i i i wrote the book the happiest corruption um because we are happy and there's a lot of corruption and i had hoped to get people's attention so that they could see what yeah, happens when the dichotomy of terms there yeah and like military and intelligence you know <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it was uh, so it's a true story. It's my story of what I found. And it's riveting and unbelievable and um, better than fiction. And How's I'm it hoping doing? Get it Has on it the been out long? Mm -hmm. No, it just since long? last June. It just came out. And okay? it came out on, on the same day that the first guy went to jail. <laughs> and, uh, May 27th, actually. And, uh, and then I followed up with uh, City Council 101, Insider's Guide for New Council Members. So okay. either of those would be really good reads if you, well, first, if you just want to read something kind of interesting, they make it interesting. And I have had that feedback a lot. Um, okay. But I also have something that might help caregivers. If if you listen to podcasts or you're sitting around the house and you want the equivalent of a really good radio show, I have um, a four-hour training course called Double Dias Adventures in Local Government. And it talks about how we can work together as elected representatives and the people to get things done. And, and it'll teach you what it took me probably six years to figure out how to be effective, how to get it done quickly and well. And so that's something you can either listen to or watch, but might be something that would work for folks who are doing caregiving. Yeah. And as a caregiver, I must say, if, if you caregivers out there um, read the book and get motivated to change things in your town, you're going to start changing things in your home because mm -hmm. a lot of you caregivers are miserable because, you know, the loved one perhaps isn't appreciative or, or is very difficult to deal with and orders you around, you know, like a two-year-old who wants their way. And, 
and you're just an enabler or you don't like confrontation and you just uh, you've let your environment get out of control so to speak and you're burning out maybe if you can uh, learn lessons from your book about not only how to straighten out your government but how to straighten out your own life would you agree absolutely you know no matter what the situation is, whenever you take action, mm. you feel better. And action and people generates notice action. and people respond, don't they? You meet people, you meet really interesting people, you know what's going on, you find, you maybe find out that you're not the only one experiencing this. Mm. And um, so excuse the train, I'm right by the train station, you can hear the whistle blow. And um, I think it must be that time now. <laughs> and um but the other thing is, you know, that whole thing of just taking some action, even if you're depressed. And I went through a period of, uh, I, I'm inclined to get depressed every once in a while. Um, really? It's in my genetics and uh, inherited that one. And so, but I found, um, and I didn't have a profound depression. I know sometimes it isn't possible, but sometimes you put one foot after the other. And all you do is you just put one foot after the other. And this could be that one foot that would help help things start moving in a better direction. Hmm. Well, how can people get a hold of you and learn out more from you? If you have uh, some advice uh, that we didn't discuss on the show, or they want to buy your book, or they want to ask you some questions. The books are available in libraries, bookstores, Amazon, um, online, and you can um, actually ask your library and they'll probably get it for you. Really? So um, you can even read it for free that way. Uh, and uh, but we also have Kindle versions so if you don't like, you know, if you enjoy that way of reading. Um, but How about everything an audible, I'm not yet, not yet. Not okay. yet. Um, I have it, I have it recorded, but not up yet, I'm still okay. waiting for the edits. And um, but I'm I might start recording it on my podcast. But anything you're interested in, you can find from my website. It will link to my podcast. I do a podcast called Corruption Chronicles, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I know it talks about corruption and people who found it and how they fixed it. Or if there's something that you need to get out there, and we can validate it, I'll get it out there for you too. So go to debbiepeterson.com, D-E-B-B-I-E-P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N, um, and you'll be able to find links to anything we've talked about today. And contact Great. me if you'd like to. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I know you would have been here anyway uh, co-hosting, but uh, I did want to do a show, especially with you, talking about what you do and your and your passion because you're new as a co-host and people need to know who you are. And I Thank want everyone you. to remember that all our live shows become recorded pod and video casts on all your favorite platforms that I mentioned. My number one newly released book, Secrets from the Hammock, Uncommon Wisdom for Uncommon Times, is spreading wisdom all over the world. It's available wherever books are sold and also on my free membership website, caregiverdave.com. And if you join my Caregiver Dave Facebook community of 34,000 caregivers, you will learn all about my new Acapulco Villa Caregiver Wellness Retreat and Vacation. Now, I offer this to burned out caregivers. I'm trying to keep as many of those 30% of caregivers who actually die before their loved ones do alive. <laughs> so if you click the link uh, or the like or the follow button on whatever platform you're watching or listening to this interview, it helps us reach even more caregivers by improving Google search engine algorithms. So thanks again to all my listeners out there all over the world tuning in every Wednesday and making us the number one caregiver podcast on the internet. So until next week, same time, same channel. May God richly bless you all. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. It's Dave Nassani, otherwise known as Caregiver Dave. And I'm coming to you live from this beautiful Acapulco Villa, which I like to say is the perfect prescription for caregiver burnout. And I have a unique opportunity to bring 14 burned out caregivers up here so that they can decompress and do all the things that they need to do. But this is just a bonus. It actually comes with the six month Zoom coaching program. It's a one-on-one -on -one consult with me, Caregiver Dave, to identify where you are and where you need to go. It's a six monthly small group coaching sessions to smash any obstacles between you and your ideal vision of what a caregiver needs to be and caregiver success. You get my three free books and instructions on boundaries, grief, self-care, organization, asking for help, learning how to say no, avoiding burnout, avoiding depression, avoiding perfectionism, avoiding isolation, avoiding resentment, delegation, 
team building, how to have fun, how to have no guilt, the importance of gratitude, and after caregiving when you're no longer a caregiver. But this seven day bonus is absolutely free. It comes with the coaching program that you pay for. And the food is all inclusive. I'm telling you, seven days and seven nights here is amazing. This is truly paradise. And I highly recommend it. For more information, go to caregiverdave.com. That's gonna send you to my other website. And if you want a shortcut to get there immediately, just go to acapocodave.com. Thanks again. I look forward to seeing you in Acapulco. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing.